On the morning of January 6th, President Donald Trump's intention was to remain President of the United States despite the lawful outcome of the 2020 election and in violation of his constitutional obligation to relinquish power. Over multiple months, Donald Trump oversaw and coordinated a sophisticated seven-part plan to overturn the presidential election and prevent the transfer of presidential power. In our hearings, you will see evidence of each element of this plan. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muckrake Podcast. I'm Jared H. Sexton. I am here, as always, with Nick Houselman. Uh, we have so much to cover today, but we have to begin, of course, with uh, the now very popular television show, the January 6th Committee Hearings. Uh, we wondered... Uh, last week in our Patreon exclusive of the first hearing, and that's over at patreon.com slash podcast. Uh, we wondered, will people watch? Will people talk about it? Will this hold the, the, the national attention? Nick, we've got some answers on that. While we have a lot more questions that are growing, 20 million people watched the primetime January 6th committee hearing. Nick, uh, check my figures on that. Uh, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. I have a little context for you, if you like. Um, it's about the same amount of people that watch Kavanaugh's GOTIS hearing. Wow. So I, you would have thought it would be more, but but that tells you. Here, here's the thing. A whole half of the country wasn't ever going to watch it anyway, right? So it's that's a pretty concentrated 20 million. It might even be more impressive because of that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really huge thing, and and what we've already seen, and we're recording this as the uh, second hearing is is going. Uh, this is already turning into a ready made, ready to package and consume uh, political spectacle, which is what we talked about last week. That not only was it intended to be, but that it needed to be in order to to move the needle a little bit. We are already. Just a couple of days removed from this thing, Nick, and what we're having a conversation about now is whether or not this committee and its findings are going to lead to an actual indictment of Donald Trump and his co-conspirators. Uh, the numbers that we're seeing in terms of polls are huge. Uh, a, a massive majority of Americans believe it's essential that we find out what has happened here, uh, upwards of 70 percent. Um, it seems like the cultural conversation is turning towards whether or not Donald Trump should be charged with a crime here. Uh, now we have a uh, friend of the pod, Steve Bannon, basically daring the Department of Justice to indict Donald Trump. Trump won the presidency, and he is the legitimate president of the United States, and your guy's illegitimate, and the American people are awakening to that. And we don't care what you have to say, and I dare Merrick Garland to take that crap there last night and try to indict Donald J. Trump. We dare you, because we will impeach. We're winning in November, and we're going to impeach you and everybody around you. Be fuck, screw the White House. We're going to impeach you and everybody in DOJ. So here we come to the question. Will Donald Trump be indicted for his role in a conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States? Um, we're going to get to some of the public sort of wrestling with this. Uh, but before we do, Nick, what, what, what's your feeling on this? If you had to if you had to say right now, is there anything coming down the pike? I think the question could very well be who's going to get uh, impeached first or indicted versus impeached. Will Biden get impeached first by the Republican Congress or will Trump get indicted by any kind of Department of Justice? That's an interesting race to see who gets that first. Um, I, I kind of feel like, I mean, listen, if we want to look at the whole like Al Capone, you know, get him on tax evasion charges, right? There, there are a couple things that are very clear that he violated as far as defrauding, you know, a, a national election. That, hey, the state of Georgia is still looking into the possibility for him pressuring officials. Yeah. And then plus that with the pressuring of Pence, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of lawyers out there. I'm a lawyer. I play one on TV. Um, think that that's enough. And that, that would probably be enough. Again, we're just trying to get him off to the side so he can't run again. I mean, that's not really the thing. He needs to go to prison so no one else tries to do this again. But but. Um, I, I, I do feel like it's, it's maybe 50-50 that they're going to they're gonna be able to charge him with something. So you've got it at a coin flip at this point. Yeah. 
Well, I've seen a lot of very wealthy white men skate on a lot of charges, so I'm not particularly certain about that. And I do have to tell you, um, the Department of Justice has decided to start wringing its hands in public because uh, apparently that's what Mary Garland and the people around him are uh, good at. I had wondered what they were good at. Is he, is he related to Susan Collins? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but I do know that they share a certain strain of concern. Yeah, they do. Uh, so like clockwork, and we talk about this on the podcast all the time, uh, just to go ahead and pull the curtain back on how this stuff works. Public figures and politicians really like to air their laundry out in, um, articles, segments. They like to basically float this kind of stuff to send messages, to send signals to people, basically to say, I understand that most Americans want Donald Trump to be indicted for the for his role in this thing. We're thinking about it. We're considering it. We're concerned. And like clockwork, this article, um, NBC News, by the way, has been carrying a lot of water for elected officials and political officials lately. This has sort of become in the last few months the go to place to start trafficking some of these stories. This dropped in our laps. This is by Ken Delanian. Does the Justice Department want to charge Trump? And let's go ahead and dive a little bit into this. Um, as, as, as my people would say, Nick, this is a uh, spicy a meatball. <laughs> uh, so this article begins, uh, Liz Cheney's powerful remarks at Thursday night's January 6th congressional hearing on the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, which sounded a lot like a lawyer's opening statement at a criminal trial. Well, no shit, because it was have renewed a debate in legal circles about whether the Justice, Justice Department could and should prosecute Donald Trump. With a growing body of evidence that Cheney and others say points to criminal acts involving Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election results, Attorney General Merrick Garland may ultimately be faced with an excruciatingly difficult decision about whether prosecuting a former president is in the national interest. Well, I, I agree. Yeah, it is an excruciating uh, decision, but I do have to say... Who gives a shit if you make a decision if it's in the national interest? Isn't your job to uphold the law? Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. But does he want to then watch the country burn outside of his uh, office building? Well, let's have that conversation. A person familiar with the matter told NBC News there have been conversations inside the Justice Department about the far-reaching implications of pursuing a case against Trump should it come, that, come to that. So far... No public evidence has surfaced that the former president has become a criminal target. Quote, unquote, we will follow the facts wherever they lead, Garland said in a speech at Harvard University's commencement ceremony. Nick, I, I, I got to tell you, you either have a legal code, you either have the rule of law, or you don't. And I'm tired of living in a country where corporations are too big to fail, people are too big to be arrested and held accountable. This is... This is really upsetting. I got a question for you. When Nixon was thrown out of office, remember, his approval rating was still 25%, which is, you know, basically zero. You can't go below 25 at this point, it seems like. So um, they could have prosecuted Nixon. We would not have had civil war. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Why? Uh, there, the, the particular moment in time and with Nixon's numbers where they were as well as the republican party and and this is something that we try and remind the audience of constantly which is nixon resigned not because he had a flash of conscience mm -hmm. it's because the republican party came to him and said sir it's time to go and they were ready to stand off to the side and say listen he needs to go hopefully we can move past this um the, there was no fox news uh, there was no right wing uh, propaganda sphere out there in order to twist this thing and turn it into a situation. So, no, I don't think if Nixon would have been prosecuted, a civil war would have broke out. Right. OK, so uh, and, and it has to do with approval ratings. Right. There's enough people uh, in this country that still believe what all of Trump's lies that would take up arms. Right. That, that that is the real fear. And I'm sure the Department of Justice has even more information than we do about the real threat of that. Well, I, I, I think whether or not they have information for it or not is a different question. 
uh, whether or not they are so timid that they're terrified of it is a different thing. Right. Right. I mean, I, listen, Garland has shown time and time again that uh, he is a pretty standard type of attorney general. He's not particularly interested in getting involved in these types of things. Uh, people have brought up uh, troubling elements of his resume and connections that he has. We've talked about it ad nauseum on this show. Nobody wants to charge a former president because the moment you charge a former president with any crime, I mean, the the whole Jenga tower starts coming down because you can't be president without uh, committing crimes, basically. I, I think there is a reason to be concerned. I'm going to read this quote, and this is uh, from Barbara McQuaid, who is an NBC legal analyst and a former U.S. attorney. Filing criminal charges against Trump in connection with his efforts to overturn the election, quote unquote, will barely, very likely spark civil unrest and maybe even civil war. But she said, I think not charging is even worse because not charging means you failed to hold someone criminally accountable who tried to subvert our democracy. I'll say this, Nick. I, I think it is likely to spark civil unrest. I do. But I kind of feel like we're at the point where you got to let those chips fall where they may. I hate to say that. I know that people would be hurt. I know that it could be a really bad combustible situation. You cannot let this go. I mean, I agree. I, again, we're worried about the next guy coming in following yeah. the playbook who's much less addled than Trump, right? That's the real fear because that's where you get into the Damien Omen 3 uh, version of our United States, right? Is that why it's Omen 3? <laughs> it's all for you, Ron DeSantis. <laughs> it's all for you. Right. Is it? It's number three, right, where he runs for president? I think it is, right? Uh, maybe four, If three. you think that I, if I followed the Omen movie series all the way to number three, you are wrong, my friend. Oh, wow. They, they, it's pretty amazing. There might be some, like, nudity that a teenage Nikki Hauselman was really into. But I got to tell you, there's a fascinating political thing. We could watch that movie, whichever one is, where he becomes president or tries to become president. Um, could we do it? Anyway, um, here's the thing I found interesting. Let's just pretend for a second, because, you know, with the hearings, there's all sorts of crossover talking about this and we're talking about the prosecution. Um, do you, don't you find it striking that we hear so much of Barr going to the White House to have discussions with Donald Trump? And in, in what I'm saying specifically is that isn't it your understanding, as far as I understood the, the government function, that the White House and the Department of Justice need to be pretty clearly separated? Yeah, yeah. 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 OK, so imagine if this was Trump in the White House now and they're discussing Biden and whatever he had been doing. Do you think that Trump would bring the AG over to his office and demand that Biden uh, would get uh, prosecuted for whatever they, he thinks he might have done? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And we know this because he said this. He would do this to Hillary Clinton, right? He said it constantly. <laughs> right. So imagine that, because because my only question now is, are, are you advocating for perhaps some influence by Biden on Merrick Whoa. Garland? As a matter of fact, listen, to OK, this comes from the article. I'm glad you brought this up. So let me read you a quick passage from this article and I'll, I'll answer your question. OK, the Justice Department. This is, again, the NBC News report, which, of course, they are talking to the Department of Justice. They're probably talking to Merrick Garland. Right. Because this is what you do. You talk on background, you fill them in and they go ahead and they give the narrative to everybody. So here we are. The Justice Department, by tradition, makes criminal charging decisions independent of the president. By the way, by tradition. Yeah. By tradition. No. How about you always need to. Uh, but in cases that implicate, for example, American diplomacy or national security, the executive branch can and does weigh in. Biden would have the legal authority to make the final decision about whether to prosecute. First of all, before we move forward. No, no. <laughs> Let's not have Biden or any other political uh, 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 elected official give the go ahead to prosecute a former president for trying to overthrow the government. Let's not do that. Did I miss that sentence? Wow, I, I don't think I realize he does have the legal authority to make that final decision. That's interesting oh, to me. God, uh, one of the people they're talking to, that's a fascinating question. It feels to me that the president would have to weigh in. We were talking about this monumental decision. Biden was elected, not Garland. At some point, this becomes a policy question, not strictly a legal one. Bullshit. 
It's a legal question. Keep this within the ramifications of the law. McQuaid, who was earlier talking in the article, it would be a terrible idea. I think you cannot loop in the president. You can give him a heads up, but I don't think you consult him. That undermines the idea of an independent justice department. Amen. Thank God somebody said it. We don't need to live in a country where the president is having the former president indicted and prosecuted. Let's stay away from that shit. Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree. I feel like they need to be completely independent. Although it's funny because you know, in a different kind of kangaroo uh, banana republic, uh, the Justice Department could become all powerful as well and start prosecuting everybody without any uh, way to interfere either. It's uh, th you know, this is a delicate balance we're here. This this experiment that we're trying. You're telling me, man, <laughs> that's what's at stake. In a banana republic, Trump would have either been dead or on house arrest at this point. I mean, that that's what we're literally talking about. Well, actually, that's not true. In a banana republic, Trump would be wearing a military uniform, making sure that his rivals were either right. dead. He'd still be in the White House, is what you're saying. No, he'd still be in the White House. Yeah. That's exactly right. This is absolutely insane. And and I just want to point out, like, this is one of those articles that just sort of floats through the milieu of the, the American political environment. This is the Department of Justice sending signals out to journalists, to politicos, to other politicians that says, hey, we're paying attention. We're thinking about it. Here's what our, we're wrapping our heads around. Basically, they are telegraphing the fact that they kind of are saying we're waiting on someone to give us a cue. And I got to tell you, man, that's troubling. And Merrick Garland is not an effective attorney general. And, and this is also, and I hate to say it, it's indicative of a lot of the Biden administration. It's a lot of people who are sitting around saying, well, somebody else is going to figure this thing out and we'll do our part when we are part of it. This sucks. You know what could happen, really, is that uh, they pull up Mueller. And rather than do any kind of uh, recommendations for what they should do, they just simply say, eh, here you go, whatever, maybe maybe you'll impeach yeah. the guy, I don't know. Well, right? I, for a second, Nick, I got to tell you, my heart kind of skipped a beat. I thought you were going to suggest that they put Robert Mueller in charge. Of oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, please, please, no, don't. Yeah, no, he just retired, by the way. That popped up in my timeline. Uh, although, hey, con congrats, Robert Mueller, on, yeah. a, on a hell of a career, my man. Yeah, he deserves to sit by a beach and drink a pina colada. I think, I, but I, he, he, he deserves something. Right. And listen, he, for the past uh, stuff, but the Mueller report, yeah. I mean, the fact that he chickened out and didn't refer is ridiculous. And by the way, Merrick Garland can easily live in that same headspace and be the same way where it's like, well, we've got like five pretty ironclad cases of obstruction of justice or They've got like fraud. seven conspiracy charges that they can bring against Trump. Yeah. And like, but, you know, who's to say what the Office of Legal, you know, opinion has and so I don't know you know and then and then yeah then the president Biden can't step in and be like you know you must charge him I, man it, it ends up become man this is so frustrating the idea that we're living in this democratic republic that is on the verge of absolute ruin and everyone's just kind of looking around at each other and they're like I don't know are you gonna do something about this are you gonna or maybe not I guess yeah I don't know it's uh, it's it's frightening, and again, it's all because. Well, listen, Trump deserves to be prosecuted, but it's really yes. about you know. And by the way, we get in this conversation all the time. If he goes to prison and he gets indicted up the wazoo and serves the rest of his life in prison, is that going to stop DeSantis from doing the same exact thing? Well, and I so just to go ahead and preview later on the show, we're going to have a segment where we're talking about the fact that there are a lot of Republicans right now mm -hmm. who are looking at twenty twenty four. And they are thinking about a life after Trump. And there is something happening here. And I, I don't know if you feel it. This is something that we sort of talked about a little bit last week, getting ready for the hearings and then watching the initial hearing. There is a feeling that a lot of people within the Republican Party, they know that they can't come out and say Trump should be prosecuted. They can't come out and say that I'm anti-Trump. They still have to court that base. There are a lot of people in that party right now who are ready to move on beyond Donald Trump. And in all of this, a big question has to become, and this, I think, splits this, this question, civil unrest, civil war. I don't think prosecuting Donald Trump will lead to civil war. I think it will lead to some disturbances and some radicalization, but also 
maybe the effect could be negated a little bit if some of these Republicans are starting to feel like they want to move beyond him. And so you got to look at like your, your, your Cheney, your Kinzinger, you know what I mean? You go down the line, you start to wonder how many Republicans are ready to turn that page. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, there's no lack of Republicans who are bloodthirsty, you know, power mongering, you know, uh, whatever, you know, people just need attention. Right. So so that's going to happen either way. I mean, listen, if I, if I if we have to fucking listen to Tom Cotton campaign, oh. I'm going to f- throw my computer out the window. It, I can't I can't do it. I just I can't do it. But but, you know, we're getting a little glimpse into maybe why Liz Cheney. Listen, we, she, I, I want to give her a lot of respect. What she's doing is terrific and how she's laying this out and she's whatever. But come on. She knows she's going to be on the screen in front of 20 million Americans at any one time sounding powerful and sounding, you know, standing up to Trump. You know, when's her when I think she's already booked a trip to Iowa at some point in the next week. Right. So keep your eye on that one. So, you know, there, there's got to be a little bit of um, cynicism there as far as what her motivations were for doing for doing what she did, for joining well, the, the, the thing, the hearing. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that trip to Iowa and some other uh, conspicuous trips to New Hampshire by some other people here in just a minute. But one of the things that I think Cheney is taking advantage of, like a lot of other uh, uh, elected officials right now, is a leadership of pub- – or a, a vacuum of public leadership. Uh, Biden, of course, we talked about this, I think it was last week, we talked about how he sort of left a really big gap for senators to sort of negotiate their own stuff, to find their own paths, and then, you know, he'd say he'd sign it. Um, We have also seen in the past few days that Democratic and Republican senators have, uh, on principle, made an agreement uh, on gun safety, gun control, whatever we want to call it. Um, we've heard about this compromise, which uh, was led on the Democratic side by Chris Murphy and on the Republican side by John Cornyn. Um, this is a thing, by the way, that is probably going to pass, probably going to get signed. Uh, Biden will get no credit for it whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and listen, I, we, we need to go down what the specifics are of this in order to get everyone up to speed, what happened, get the information out there. And then we'll talk about our reactions to it, our concerns with it, uh, where it looks like it's it's working, where it's not. Uh, this is a compromise. It's going to include upwards of 10 Republican senators, which means that this is going to pass the filibuster. Uh, this will probably end up passing. Uh, the details of this compromise, as it's come out, uh, there are going to be incentives for states to pass their own laws. Uh, I think we, speaking of semantics, we've moved from calling them red flag laws to crisis intervention laws. Thank you, Washington, D.C., undefeated in semantics. Yeah, crisis inter- intervention orders, uh, you know, which is, seems even more like uh, in your face and whatever, but uh, hey, I'll take it. Uh, we've got investments for mental health programs. Uh, we've got money for suicide prevention programs. Uh, we've got money for quote unquote school security. Get your fences, get your guns, get your armed quote unquote resource yeah. officers, get or as I like to call them, police Get rid officers. of some doors. Kid, knock those doors the <laughs> hell out. Let's, let's make them into I'm more so walls. anti-door. I can't <laughs> stand it. Uh, we've also got, I actually think this is one of the best parts about the compromise. Uh, there are uh, some initiatives in there to get rid of uh, the ability for domestic violence uh, uh, to get those people away from guns. Uh, we're also talking about possible separate background checks for buyers under 21 years of age. Um, just before we get into the pros and the cons, what, what are your initial thoughts on this thing? I mean, listen, it's it's unprecedented. They haven't done anything for 30 years on this, and it's perfectly appropriate for people that want to celebrate like the absolute bare minimum thing that they could maybe kind of do to inch something that probably won't really prevent mass shootings anyway. But hey, let's pat ourselves on the back. I so here's the thing, and and Nick, how scale of one to ten, how how cynical how cynical am I about modern politics? Uh, you know, is, is there a higher number? Or I just stop at there 10? are fifteen. Yeah, I'll say this: there's some stuff in here that'll probably save some lives. 
Okay. I mean, really. Like, listen, the separate background checks for the people under 21 uh, is an absolute bullshit compromise. It's probably going to keep a couple of troubled people from getting a hold of guns. Yeah. And God knows how many people that might save. The domestic violence prevention thing is incredible. For sure. Thank God. Um, I'm glad that mental health programs are getting money, but because Republicans are a part of this, it will turn into a punitive uh, carceral type situation. Uh also, by the way, Nick, I don't know if you noticed, I no guns were banned in this. No stocks were banned. Nothing was ha- nothing was taken away. Uh, basically, this is a laundry list of things that Republicans wanted to do. That's that's the truth. Right. Yeah. So, and, and and your point being that it was only like the Republicans like we'll do this and that's it and take that's it true. or leave it and you're not going to get us to move anywhere else and the and the Democrats were like okay fine we'll take it. And notice, and, and the thing that, that the big headliner in all of this, the red flags are crisis intervention things. It's not a national law. It's not a national program. It's another incentive program that will offer to give money to states if they go ahead and pass these things. Will red states pass it, Nick? Probably not. Well, yeah. maybe a couple. Yeah, I mean, maybe a couple of like leaning purple red states, but most of them are not going to. This is the compromise that happens when, as we've talked about, Nick, power at the federal level is just absolutely neutered. Yeah, it's, it's been completely knocked down in order to bring it down to the state level. This is the type of compromise the Republicans can get away with without suffering real political damage. Although I'm sure they'll be primaried by NRA, wild eyed, insane people. Uh, but this is it's not enough. To pretend like it's enough is is insulting to the people who have died and the people who will die uh, in in these mass shootings. Uh, it's something, but it's also just the absolute barest minimum that can be done. Yeah, I mean, the, and the red flag laws we talked about this before it, they're they're temporary, so it doesn't really mean a lot anyhow, um, and that's really frustrating. I am encouraged to see the mental health thing. I'm kind of curious to see how that's going to actually manifest itself in in real help for people you, you think it might be more just punitive but um i i would hope that they could figure out another way to, to to treat people who need serious help i listen it would be great if i had any faith that the republicans were serious about mental health uh in all of this i mean listen you can't talk about any of this without drilling down further and talking about the socioeconomic causes of all of this when you talk about mental health you talk about mental illness so much of it has to do with the strain that a culture like this puts on people you know what happens when you're exploiting people when you're working them too hard I'm, i'm sorry we live in a country right now where there's no real vision for the future that's crushing and when that happens people suffer and society suffers we can talk about mental health but that's actually just taking care of a side effect of a larger problem that none of these people want to even begin touching and and that that that's this whole thing in a nutshell it's a lo- it's a lot of larger problems that nobody really wants to put their uh put their skin on the line in and really go to bat for and as a result you get a compromise that maybe will do a little bit of good but it's not going to take on the problem proper Right. I, I get the sense that like young kids and young teenagers probably don't really see a future because of climate change. Yeah. Um, and let's just if you play that out a little bit, like we weren't, we're not going to have a real civil society once it becomes clear that the that the environment is going to fail. Right. Like and it'd be, it'll become a lawless, you know, Wild West kind of a thing. I would imagine once we realize, oh, shit, like we're not going to have any water in the next, like a few years from Ooh, now. We're I, have- I'll say this. That vision doesn't have to be true (laughs) like we can decide that it isn't true we can pick a different future we're still technically scientifically in that zone where we can change course the problem is that our leadership and representation that they are either bought and sold by you know fossil fuel uh or these special interests gun lobbies you name it uh, corporations that they can't offer an alternative view. And all of this is, it's literally like, Nick, I don't know if you've ever had like an old beat up car in your life. You ever, you ever had that? I used to have this like really beat up Pontiac Grand Am. It was black and it had a skunk stripe up the top. You know what I mean? Where like the paint had started to fade. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Man, let me tell you something about that car. That car broke down every couple of months and you'd take it to the to the mechanic and you'd be like hey 
what does it need? <laughs> and the mechanic would go down the list and basically it'd say you need a new car. Right. And then, right. then you'd say, okay, I appreciate that. What does it need to get back on the road today? Right. And right. he'd be like, well, we can do this, but it's just going to break down in a month. And it's like, yeah, let's do that. That's great. Yeah. And that's what this is. It's a bunch of band-aids on larger problems. And this, I'm sorry, but this is two political parties understanding that they have to do something because public outrage is getting too large. Jared, you just made me realize that I'm a Pontiac Grand Am. God damn it. I would like to be like, you know, a Lamborghini or something, but I'm a Pontiac Grand Am. So just Nick, get, me on this, Pontiac Grand get me on that, you know, on the road just for another uh, month. Uh, what, what, what do I got to take? What pills do I have to take? Anything, please. Um, I, yeah, I hear you. And, you know, um, the, the the climate thing we don't have to take a tangent on that but it's like uh, it is interesting because it does it's a pall over the entire process here that I'm, you're kind of waiting for now we, so is the like the market and our economic situation yeah. as it is with inflation too because it's, th this is going to be a thing I, I, here's the thing people don't want to be inconvenienced and I think that's a big motivation for politicians because they realize if you ask them to do something about the climate, use less water. It's an inconvenience. They get mad. They won't vote for you. Right. They want you to they want to hear you say as a politician, you can use as much water as you want. You can just say whatever you want to say. Use Don't worry more about water. It. Yeah, right. Here's more water. Don't worry. You about know what? We're the United States of fucking America. You're going to get more water. Yeah. Like, so yeah. at some point, that's what happened, right? That's the one of the big fractures was that, you know, because there are a number of people in this country that want to are willing to do things to save the environment or to help people with health care or to just treat people better and, 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 and call them how they would like other people would like to be called and, and described. And then there's another sex section of the country that can't be bothered and doesn't want to be inconvenienced by anything. at all. For anything, and that, you know, that gas and food, whatever we're talking about, I, I'm not calling somebody by a pronoun that I don't want to you call them by like that. So that's that's probably the crux of where we are. And the question is, how many are on one side versus how many on the other side, and then where do they live in, in which district? I was talking about this. Uh, I was doing this um, recording for my Substack before the January sixth hearing, and I was talking about this where. A large part of the American problem is exactly that. The compromise that we've made to not have a better future, because to have a better future means that you take chances, right? It means that you change things, that you you go down a path. And why do you go down the path? You go down a path because a leader convinces you it's in your best interest to take chances. Now, one of the problems that we have right now is that we have two major political parties in this country. Neither one of them is interested in big changes. Well, actually, that's not true. That's not true. The Republican Party is starting to make big change propositions. It just so happens that they're like horrific and anti-democratic and theocratic and dangerous. Right. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party has become the party of basically being like, hey, listen, we're dealing with a few bad apples here. Donald Trump. Right. Pay no attention to the people who funded this, who made sure that all this stuff happened. If we can just get rid of him, don't worry, everybody. You can go to Fuddruckers every night. You know, you you are an American. You have the right to just waste as much water as you possibly want. You know, run as much electricity as you possibly want and gas. Go down to Fuddruckers. Go to the Fuddruckers across the street from the Fuddruckers, right? And that's the deal in America, which is you can go to the store and buy whatever you want, except for the fact that that's starting to break down. Right. You can you can live a life that you can pay no attention to what's going on in politics, what's happening in society. You can have a consumer paradise as long as you don't trouble for change. And there's something in our brains that is very terrified at the prospect of change. I might have to give something up. You know what I mean? Like I could lose something in that change. And right now, the only party that's making an argument for actual change is the Republican Party. It just so happens that their argument is for handing everything back over to white, wealthy, evangelical men and getting rid of democracy. And that's not a path we should be going down. Right. And then and any kind of negative repercussions from that change are the, the fault of the Democrats. 
You're right. going to make us do all these things that you don't like and that probably are bad for the country, but it'll be your fault because we had to because you wanted uh, you know, trans people to have rights or something like that. I don't know exactly. Right. Sure and, and no, you're going to destroy society and culture and it's going to degenerate because you want to do those things and we have to save it from this apocalyptic deal. This is one of the reasons, and I'm glad that you brought up the market. You know, this is something... Nick, I mean, we've been warning about this for like over a year now. Like, listen, did it look good at a moment, the economy? Yes, it did. But the the way that capitalism works is it's going to overheat. It's going to reach the point where its inherent contradictions are going to start crunching down. We're seeing that now. We are we are essentially in a bear market at this point to the point where nobody really wants to invest in things. And it's not a safe thing to, to put your money into. Uh, right now, the Fed, which is supposed to, again, be the wizard behind the curtain, has a choice, which is either inflation, which I don't know about you, Nick, but I think I speak for myself and the rest of our listeners. It's beating the shit out of me. Like going to the store right now is awful. It is. It, it really is. And my, here's the thing about the credit card notion, right? And this has been the case for a long, long time, even with gas prices. When you use that credit card and not cash, you kind of just sort of, it doesn't feel real at all to you, Well, right? Nick, that's part of the thing that's kept America going. The idea of debt is the thing that like kept our market circulating. And everybody thought it was going to be a miracle. But the problem is when that debt starts going up because people are trying to take care of things like inflation and they're trying to make up for the money that they don't have because they're getting exploited – I, I got to tell you, at some point, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Uh, and, and how do you know this, Jared? <laughs> I know this because history has shown it multiple times. Yeah. In my lifetime, I've seen it. In your lifetime, you've seen this happen. And the problem in all of this, and this next thing we have to talk about, which, which Nick has already previewed, is really, really important. Right now, despite the fact that we have a sitting president of the United States of America who's in his first term, and is eligible for another term. We are now looking at 2024 in a way that most political operatives are considering it an open primary. They more or less, and we talked about how the January 6th hearings were going to give Biden a chance to change the narrative. Guess what? The Democratic strategist and that class is not going to let him change the narrative. They have come after him hard. And they have tried to undermine this thing constantly. And because of everything that you and I are talking about, Nick, the next couple of years are going to be weird and tough because there's no movement forward. There's no uh, like change that's on the horizon. Um, I got to tell you, I, I, I think Biden is in for a couple of tough years. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually going on my I'm, I'm selling some of my portfolio right now. Uh, I literally just decided that. <laughs> Hold on a second. I got to liquidate. Yeah. Gotta go. Well, I mean, because like, we were wondering we needed to cash or something. And it's like, well, well we, do we really want to take it out of that IRA or whatever? I'm like, yeah, because it's probably going to continue going down. Let's just do it now before we lose any more money. You know what I mean? Like, that's what we're looking at. I mean, I told you, I had this friend of mine who's a crazy guy, and he's a kind of a quant. I had a dream about him last night, too. This is what's, in, before I even knew that the market was going to be down 700 points, um, is, is that, uh, you know, this could be a bear market for, like, the rest of our lifetimes. And no one believes it because it has, that's never happened before. But, like, uh, you know, nothing, nothing we've seen in the last six years has ever happened before. And, uh, and it, the one thing we always say is it's, you know, the, the economy gets, uh, the president gets way too much credit and way too much blame. Um, there's not a lot they can do because the only thing you can do to, com to combat uh, inflation is to raise interest rates. And well, I'm now I'm not an economist, but I play one on a podcast. So raising with interest rates, I believe, is a real big countermeasure to that. And that's going to happen. But by the way, maybe then I can actually save a little money in a bank account for, for once if that ever happened and well, high enough. So one of the problems in all of this, and we're going to get to this article here in a second, um, which has I got to tell you, Dick, it's one of the most New York Times articles ever. As somebody who's published in The New York Times, worked with these editors, I got to tell you, this is one of the most quintessential New York Times headlines ever. Should Biden run in 2024? Democratic whispers of no start to rise. So they get to tell you what they think. They get to tell you what the reality of it is, but they get to hide behind. We're just asking questions, you know? So when we're talking about this, when we're talking about the presidency, the president of the United States of America right now in 2024, or in Jesus Lord, I'm already jumping forward here, in 2022, has basically been turned into a glorified mascot. There's not much that they can do at this point. They're, they're pinned in by political forces. The federal level has been restricted. 
special interest, basically rural politics in the United States of America. They are kind of on the sideline. It's it, it's almost at this point along the same notion of being the prime minister of Canada. You know what I mean? Like it's it's just another cog in a machine. And the thing is, it doesn't have to be. The presidency changes, it waxes, it wanes. I mean, George W. Bush, based on uh, Cheney, you know, the uh, Papa Cheney, basically tried to turn himself into an emperor mm -hmm. at one point and had overreaching power. But it's almost like, to go ahead and put this in terms maybe some people could understand, Nick, like in basketball, if a regular player, like, shows their ass and is just kind of a jerk, like, everybody says, oh, shut up, go away, right? You, you, if you're a bench warmer, just shut up and leave everyone alone. If you become a major star and you're indispensable and everybody's talking about you, all of a sudden, you can say whatever you want and people have to move around you and change things, correct? Yeah, yeah. I didn't think it would be LeBron, you know, slander on this podcast, but okay. But you get to a certain point where you make yourself an indispensable part of the conversation and the discourse, and suddenly you can make things happen. Yeah. Has Joe Biden done that? No, absolutely not. Not and, at all. But by the way, the only solution here, he has to run again in 2024. Right. <laughs> Take me down that road. OK. Who else is going to run? I, the, the, the country, unfortunately, will not elect a gay man as a president in Pete Buttigieg. They, the, Kamala Harris is just looked ineffectual. I have no confidence uh, she would win. Harris has already been running fundraisers and not just fundraisers, but in South Carolina, which we covered last week, was the place that changed the entire narrative for Joe Biden running for the presidency in 2020. Yeah. Like, we are already starting to see this. Listen, we've already got a run of people. Let me go down this list real fast of, of potential candidates. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, tell me, you, do you like the movie Groundhog Day, Nick? I, I, and I'm not sure I, I hold it up as high as like a lot of people do, but I like. I definitely enjoyed it. Okay. Here, here are the, the people being named as, as possible rivals for Biden or replacements in 2024. Senators Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota, Bernie Sanders of Vermont, Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, and Cory Booker of New Jersey, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, and Beto O'Rourke. Nick, it's the exact same 2020 field. That's it. It's mm -hmm. the exact same field. Yeah. Did that, did that field set the world on fire, by the way? Well, no. But and, and again, why did Biden suddenly in South Carolina take control of the race? Why? Because Obama and Cliver came yeah. in and basically changed the entire narrative and tenor of the thing. And, and why did they do that? They did it because nobody had a possibility of beating Bernie Sanders and then beating Donald Trump. People don't talk about this enough. Cliver and Obama literally went out to the Democratic field and said, Hey, y'all need to drop out and get behind Joe Biden. That's the only way to make this thing happen. That's what changed the race in 2020. And, there and were, they weren't lying. And they were not lying. So, yeah, cut to 2024. I mean, listen, Kamala is only running if Biden says you can run. Like, has that ever happened before where a uh, vice president tries to... Uh, sidestep into a primary. You know what, Nick? We're so. in whole new territory. We've got presidents trying to get their vice presidents hung. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we, okay. we don't know where that's going. Yeah. So, I, and I agree because, again, the only reason why we we chose Biden was because we needed to get Trump out of there, right? We just needed him gone. It didn't matter necessarily, but whoever was going to, we knew was going to win the most votes to get him out of there. That's what we needed to do. And by the way, that we need the, the, the country needed to break all an all-time record for votes to do it, even though it was kind of a landslide nationally. Um, every one of those votes counted. So you can't have anything close uh, in 2024 because it's like Trump's going to win it. Um, so yeah. let, let's jump in this. Should Biden run 2024? Democratic whispers of no uh, start to rise. A reminder, by the way, everybody knows that right now Biden is trying to change the narrative. That is, Biden basically went out in public with a giant sign that said about to start to change the narrative. And this is... This is basically a grasp to pull him back. Again, remember these stories are always about changing perception, going after each other's narratives, trying to send signals. Listen to this opening. Oh, this is tough. Midway through the 2020 primary season, many Democratic lawmakers and party officials are venting their frustrations with President Biden's struggle to advance the bulk of his agenda, doubting his ability to rescue the party from a predicted midterm trouncing and increasingly viewing him as an anchor 
that should be cut <laughs> loose in 2024. Ow! Yes. You know what I'm thinking of? Uh, there's a funny uh, Monty Python sketch where he's trying to sell an albatross uh, to the crowd uh, at the Hollywood Bowl. This is an albatross, yes. Do you really believe that, though? Do you think that he's an anchor that's pulling everybody down to the uh, bottom of the ocean? No, I don't think that's the problem. I think it's the fact that the Democratic Party doesn't have a message. Okay. The The Democratic Party's anchor is that it allows the Republican Party to define it and spends all of its time denying what the Republican Party says while never replacing it with any other message. They basically don't have a platform other than saying, guess what, the Republicans are awful, we're not going to do what they do. Right. That's it. Yeah. Instead of saying something like, you know what, we need to shore up our voting laws. Yes. You know, and we know what, we got to shore up our gun laws. You know, it's, it would be really easy, wouldn't it? Nick, think about this. Have you ever been in like, I, I don't know if you had roommates. I don't, I don't, I don't know what you were, you were doing in your time in the Midwest. You have roommates or you go out and you vacation with people. You're living in a house. You look around and it's an absolute sty. Right. Mm -hmm. It needs to be cleaned. The dishes need washed. The floors need swept. You look around and somebody has to say, hey, we need to fix this. So let's fix it. And it gets an energy going and you do all of it. This is the problem right now. Exactly what you're saying. Momentum can be build, built by shoring up voting rights. Momentum can be built by helping people who need help. It can it can be built by coming up with an agenda that has larger aspirations and that's just not happening at this moment does it seem to you because you know for a long time for decades and decades certainly you know when biden was in was still fit vim and vigor what's the, whatever he still had that um you know it was the it was the uh independence right that was the group that they needed to to yep. capture to win these elections and so they would cater to them I mean, do, in this day and age, I, I wonder if that's even a thing anymore. I mean, you know, I used to remember, imagine in 2004, how could you be undecided as late as October of 2004? And that was a thing, right? People are undecided. They had to figure this out between Bush and, uh, and um, gosh, I, I just was talking about Gore. Him. What? Gore. No, no, in 04. You know. Um, oh, our, Carrie. Carrie, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe that that's still a, a, a voting block that's worth going after, right? Well, so the problem in all of this is that, like, so many people have gotten so tired of politics because, one, it doesn't do anything for them, right? They, they have the understanding that most politicians are full of shit, which, by the way, guilty. They are mostly full of shit, uh, that the entire thing is rigged against them for wealthy people. That's exactly right. A lot of those people. And I want to be very honest about this because we need to be honest if we're going to actually move forward and make this better. A lot of those people who weren't going out to vote, the only people who have turned them on in years, Barack Obama back in 2008 and then Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders in 2016. And those were the people who got to some of those people who weren't interested in voting. And it was because they came in a way that was different. They talked about issues differently. They talked about actually shifting around economics. By the way, Donald Trump was absolutely lying when he said all of that, but he said it, which is something that a lot of politicians simply have no desire to do at this point. You know, um, the difference with Trump in my mind was he turned it into a game. and they're, they're a team that you want to cheer for, right? Yep. And, yep. and, and maybe that was always that way, but it just feels like the, the people he activated that hadn't participated because they didn't think politics did anything for them, what it does for them now, nothing tangible, right? They're not going to get any benefit from the government, like, like, you know, now versus then having voted for Trump and having him in office, but they have something that they can cheer for and dunk on people with and, and you know, and, and, and lure that over and troll. Like that's sort of, I think, what they've done, right? That, and, and that's given people, that, that's powerful. And we've, we had Nick Harmony on the show talking about what the effect of, of, of being that way is on the brain. And uh, when you understand that scientifically, which Trump doesn't do that, doesn't understand it from an academic standpoint, but he viscerally can understand that reaction. Um, this is what you get, right? And now, and that's the only way to, to, to rally those people is to get them hooked on that adrenaline of of like just you know just putting libs down and dunking on them and drinking their tears, whatever else they like to do. Yeah, and and, and real fast, speaking of getting on teams, I want I want to read a quick quote from this article, and because I really like 
to let people know about what's happening behind the scenes, how these types of things work. This is from that New York Times piece that basically is trying to send a message to Joe Biden that you need to leave to send to the Democratic Party that everybody within the Democratic Party wants him to leave, which more or less is like a starter's pistol in the air that's like, go and find your candidate. Go so you, and find your person. You said leave and not lead. Yeah, leave. Okay. They're they're ready for Biden to basically become a lame duck before November Amazing. of 2022. That's yeah. what we're talking about. So this is from it. Quote, unquote. The presidency is a monstrously taxing job, and the stark reality is the president would be closer to 90 than 80 at the end of a second term, and that would be a major issue. Said David Axelrod, the chief strategist for Barack Obama's two winning presidential campaigns, quote unquote, Biden doesn't get the credit he deserves for steering the country through the worst of the pandemic, passing historic legislation, pulling the NATO alliance together against Russian aggression, and restoring decency and decorum to the White House, Mr. Dilly, Axelrod dilly. added. Here, here, <laughs> right? And part of the reason he doesn't is performative. He looks his age and isn't as agile in front of a camera as he once was, and this has fed a narrative about competence that isn't rooted in reality. So I want to point out what Axelrod is doing here. One, he's going ahead and paying DAP to Joe Biden, right? Mm -hmm. He's doing that because he's a political strategist who, by the way, is probably interested in finding his own horse for the horse race in 2024. He's going to find a younger candidate. My guess is he's probably already in conversation with either Harris or Buttigieg. That's the probability. My guess as of right now is probably Buttigieg, because I think Buttigieg is in tight with the Obama world crowd. I mean, Buttigieg more or less wants to be Obama. I mean, that's that's more or less his whole M.O. So what is Axelrod doing? He's laying the foundation for a narrative in which Joe Biden becomes a torchbearer who hands the torch over to a younger person. It's not his fault. Right. It's a hard job and people have this perception about him, but maybe it's time for him to go. Axelrod is in The New York Times right now setting up a path where Joe Biden will leave and he will go with another candidate. He's jockeying for position. That's what these articles are about. They don't just appear completely out of nowhere. It's about trying to get your own agenda across. Right. And, and you'll, you know, it's funny because when you watch these um, the, the hearings and you're seeing all the video of like uh, Jared Kushner and all the different people in the, in the campaign, no one is going to say anything negative like to your face. No. Everyone is going to be very positive and very nice to you. And then as soon as you leave, that is what politics is, right? They're going to try and backstab you and destroy you as much as you possibly, they possibly can to get them a leg up. And, you know, that's sort of what Axelrod is doing here as well. And there's no question that he's already, you know, he's in the talks. He's had the whispers. He's whatever it is. He knows what he's doing. You can't get to the New York Times without having some framework of what he thinks is going to happen in 2024. So uh, that, that's what politics is. Right? You, you could be the best at what you're doing in whatever job you have in the White House, but someone else wants that job and they're going to undermine you every single day. And, you know, these these political people are going to undermine you every single day they can. And, and, you know, but to your face, they're going to be really nice to you. And that's that's what's so tricky about all this. That's exactly right. And so over the exact same thing, speaking of the January 6th hearings, I mean, you said it yourself. Liz Cheney is right there square in front of the camera and is, to be honest, because of the attention paid to this thing, almost like the de facto leader of the United States right now. That's true. As Biden is kept from the cameras, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, you have these people who fill the vacuums. Joe Manchin's done it. We're looking at Liz Cheney doing it. Now, with this, we're also hearing that over on the Republican side, we're starting to see a field of potential uh, uh, candidates come out. There are more than 15 at this point, who have already built foundations in Iowa, New Hampshire. They've got the PAC structures. They've got the campaign structures that they're building up. I'm going to go through this list real fast, Nick, of people who have either said that they're thinking about running or the people around them have already confirmed. Just be careful because I've heard that if you read all these names in a row too quickly, uh, then Beetlejuice comes out. So just see, you know, just be careful how you read these. I've, I've heard that a tax cut get, for the wealthy gets passed, if you read <laughs> all of these. Okay, so I'm going to go through the list real fast before we wrap this show up. I want to get the initial thoughts on this. And I want to point out that in all of this reporting, people have said that it's really notable that Trump has not cleared the field yet. 
Because if Trump was going to be the main candidate, then that would mean that some of these people, particularly on the periphery, wouldn't even consider getting in, particularly with their relationships with Trump. He still leads in the polls, but I got to tell you, the number of people here tells me, and the personnel on the list tells me, that some people think that Trump either might not run or might not be able to run in 2024. Fair? Fair. Okay. So I'm going to go through the list and, and, and let's give our initial thoughts. Uh, Mike Pence. Yes. Six pence, none the richer. I got to tell you, I've said this on a previous episode. A Mike Pence run for the presidency in 2024 might very well be the comedy that we all deserve. I mean, I don't know. It's, I, th- I thought I was going to say it, was, it might be the saddest thing we've ever seen. But okay. He's, he is absolutely loathed by the Republican Party to the point where people tried to hang him. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, incredible. But, and you know what they say is, is comedy is just tragedy plus time. <laughs> so there it is. Can you imagine? You're 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 in the bowels of the Capitol on January sixth, right? All hell's breaking loose above. Like some Secret Service person is like code name whole milk. <laughs> They're saying they want to hang you, and, and in the back of your just absolute like idiot mind, you're like, I'm going to run for the presidency. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Uh, Tom Cotton, Tommy. Dummy, just uh, an absolute fascist in waiting. Yeah, and uh, Harvard, right? He's Harvard educated. I there? believe that's right. Do you think he has any shot of being president of the United States? Uh, you know, uh, listen, I will. I will give him a better shot than Ted Cruz, but what, what you that, but that's as lo- I mean, you're talking about in the in the single digits here. Man, he's got the charisma of watching a loved one suffer. I mean, it, he's <laughs> right. just he just does not have that aspect of it. I mean, if there's some sort of a, a, a Weimar Republic coup, you know, like the Reichstag burns down, like, I don't know, maybe Tom Cotton could make some sort of a candidacy, but I don't see it. Right. Yeah. And he, he's Harvard Law School and Harvard, Harvard. Yeah. Tim Scott, just not even going to make a dent in this. Oh right. Oh, my God. What is he doing? What's Chris Christie doing trying to put together a structure? How many times are we going to run this thing back? You know, for you know, when you do this, it's either because you know you're not going to win, but you're just getting yourself in the conversation. Like like Swalwell, for instance, did it, you know, to get himself, you know, for the future. Well, you know, he's already passed that. You know, that's not happening. But he's probably angling to become another, uh, you know, consultant or a campaign manager or whatever again, right? I think it would be really hilarious if Chris Christie just ends up becoming like the transition officer for yeah, somebody. Right. It's an expensive way to to uh, to get that job every every time, but hey. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you a real quick three people who will not be the next president of the United States of America. Larry Hogan, Nikki Haley, and Rick Scott. Yeah. Yeah, no. and Rick Scott again, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Scaring children. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, the, the, the amount of narcissism it takes to think that you could be president of the United States is astounding. But for some of these people, it's like, what a bunch of misplaced narcissism. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got I got a worse one for you. Speaking of narcissism, Mike Pompeo. Yeah, yeah. He's been angling since the day he got that job in the uh, Pentagon. Pentagon? No. Uh, where, where does the Secretary of State live or work? That's a great question. The, uh, you know, whatever building that is. Damn it. Who, who wants Mike Pompeo to be president of the United States besides Mike Pompeo and maybe like a couple of people who know him? Uh, and his wife. Oh, and he is just like an absolute crazed evangelical theocratic asshole. Yeah. And again, no charisma. Like, just one of the most annoying human beings in public uh, circles in forever. Who yeah. thinks that he could run for well, anything? Need we remind you, like, there's an NPR reporter who was interviewing him about Ukraine, and then he's like, show me where Ukraine is on a map. And, like, she's like, yeah, it's uh, right there. And he's like, oh, well, I knew that too, <laughs> whatever. Um, yeah, Foggy Bottom, by the way, is where the Oh, Foggy Bottom, yes. there you go. Uh, yeah, so please. and But again, here's the real damage is that we have to listen to this guy pretend oh. for a few months until he drops out dude he's gonna I, my prediction is if mike pompeo runs for the nomination we're going to see him in one debate and then there's going to be one of those like undercard debates yeah and right he's going to be on it and then that's going to be the end of his candidacy yeah that's a good prediction for sure ted cruz run it back again yes rafi 
I'll tell you what, when you literally have been told by everybody in your family and circles that <laughs> you are the next Messiah, you can't stop running for president. Yeah, but there's got to be people in his family and also say, hey, Ted, you know, you're kind of an asshole. <laughs> there's got to be those people in his, I hope, in his family, someone, maybe his dad, somebody has to slap him across the face and tell him. No, his dad is basically just absolutely grifting on telling people he's the second coming of Christ. Oh, okay. Well, listen, if you can't get your dad to say that about you, then who can't? Who, what, <laughs> yeah, who can't? All right. So uh, next to last, uh, this is something we actually have to talk about. Liz Cheney. I Listen, I don't think there's an even a remote possibility that Liz Cheney could win the nomination of the Republican Party, but I want to say two things about it. One. If she were to mount a serious campaign and gain any traction whatsoever, the way that our media would fawn over her would be disgusting. Like they would absolutely pave over all of her troubling positions. They would paint her as a hero. It would never, never end. Second of all, I just I don't even see a possible reality where that comes true. I I, I don't think that there is any room whatsoever. There is this fever dream idea biden is part of it the idea that the republican party will wake up from whatever they want to believe this is that they'll come to their senses that their consciences will come over it's not going to happen it's just not going to happen here here's an interesting scenario however like first of all first of all they, they go through the hearing and she continues to be really impressive and and is the the face of the whole thing they they, they refer Trump gets indicted, like, you know, and she still becomes, she's the face of, like, putting this evil scourge to bed, whatever, and then maybe she runs as independent. I mean, that is a possibility and basically runs as a spoiler at that point, right? Yeah, you know, because she's, she's kind of a spoiler right now. Maybe she would do that and, to, you know, and, and she it, uh, that's all they need. That would take down anybody running in the Republican Party. That's an interesting thought. And we wrap this up with the, uh, <laughs> outside of Donald Trump, the assumed front runner, Ronnie Donnie DeSantis. Uh, I think we all know at this point how dangerous this person is. Uh, his ability to create an autocratic uh, situation around himself, embrace this authoritarian stuff. Also, while we're on the subject, Nick, did you see the DeSantis flotilla down in Florida? Uh, is Are you describing a bunch of boats in the water in, in support of him? Yes, I am supporting a bunch of boats in the water in support of him. Uh, I got to tell you, a couple of years ago, those same people were flying Trump flags and sinking each other. Yeah, right. You know? Well, no, but this year they're they're complaining about the gas prices as they drive a vehicle that gets no miles to the gas. They're rip ass and up and down the coast. <laughs> Florida, we salute you. Never ever change, and by that I mean please change. Please, dear God, change. Uh, I will say though, I think DeSantis is growing around himself a movement of both. Trumpian MAGA people, but also uh, a lot of Republicans that we've talked about who are quote unquote serious people who want to destroy liberal democracy. Uh, I think he is uh, really, really gaining some, I, I think, troubling momentum. You know, I just typed in how much has DeSantis raised for a presidential run? And uh, it says he's raised 100 million for his Florida reelection race. This is in April of 2022. So I don't know. Nick, if I'm checking my figures. That. That's a lot of money. That's especially for a governor's race. I know it's, uh, Florida's a big state, but geez, Louise. So well, but they know they know that his reelection in Florida, he needs to run up the score. He needs to have a massive, decisive victory that gives him the momentum going right. in. That's always it, been the governor thing. And what it tells you is, if he can raise that much money now, but this early before the race. He, he he'd be able to raise a lot of money to run for the presidential uh, you know for the president in 2024 we keep covering that there are a lot of people who know that trump is an absolute moron and buffoon and they used him for their anti-democratic ideas their authoritarian ideas for you know furthering their wealth and their power those same people are going to open up their checkbooks for ron DeSantis in a way that is going to make your head spin. I mean, he is he is the godsend to right. those people. And although you argue that well, with Trump, they knew they could control him because he didn't give a shit about anything. They can't control DeSantis, but he's going to be on board with everything they want anyway. So it doesn't matter, I guess, at that point. It's, a, it's the same result, but the younger, and, better looking guy. 
And speaking of, our media is going to be eating out of the palm of his hand. They're going to be more than happy to launder him as an anti-Trump, a post-Trump, a reasonable Republican, you name it. I, I, I think the easy money's on him at this point if it's not Trump, right? Absolutely. All right, on that note... We're going to get out of here. Thank you, everybody, for listening and your support. Your wonderful a reminder that we will be back on Friday with our uh, additional bonus weekender episode. If you want access to that and all the other additional uh, goodies, including the Muckrake community, which if you're not a part of, you should be. All you got to do is go over to patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. If you need us before then, you can find Nick at Can Hear Me SMH. You can find me at J-A-Y Sexton. Be safe, everyone.